expected. <coughs> so Scala is a blend of object-oriented and functional programming. It's, it's created by Martin Odersky, um, who also had a part in, in writing the Java compiler, especially in the uh, Java generics uh, uh, component. And he had this vision, I want to blend functional programming and object-oriented programming. Uh, his idea is that object-oriented programming lends itself very well for, for constructing big programs and combining big programs and functional programming uh, works very well on a, on a small scale. Uh, one of the design choices was to make it interoperable with Java. So that, that heavily influenced Scala's design and some of the stuff from which we said, nah, that works pretty terribly in Scala is because of this choice. So it's not necessarily great for us if we want to do functional programming, but that's just uh, how it is. Um, Scala is a statically typed language, there's type inference, it's not in uh, Milner. Uh, Scala is interoperable with Java, so it also has uh, subtyping, and Hindi Milner uh, does not work with, uh, with, with subtyping. So uh, I have looked for a uh, scientific name for the uh, type inference that Scala has. I couldn't really find, find it. I found something like uh, flow based type inference, which sounds very unscientific to me. Um, in short, basically, function parameter types need to be specified, and then it can infer, uh, it can infer a lot of other types. Um, so, quickly about uh, the JVM. I guess everybody has done some job and knows something about the JVM. Uh, the JVM runs uh, bytecode, and bytecode is usually generated by the Java compiler, but sometimes by the Java compiler or Closure compiler or um, whatever. On the JVM, a class is a fundamental unit. We know classes from Java, so these are Java classes, not classical uh, type classes. Um, they're fundamental. In Java, every file compiles to a, a class, um, and every class is in, in a single file. And one of the nice things about the JVM is that it's much more liberal than, than Java language. Java has some really annoying quirks, um, but most of them are specified in the language Java. And they're not enforced by the JVM. So one of them is that some symbols are embedded in identifiers in Java. For example, the dollar sign is not embedded to use in a name in Java. Um, but the JVM doesn't care. It thinks that those are fine. Something much more important is that uh, this horrible thing, uh, check exceptions, um, which is in Java, that does not exist on the, on the JVM. So you can just generate bytecode where you interoperate with Java and where you totally blissfully ignore checked exceptions and JVM is fine. It's just gonna uh, ruin that. Um, yeah, and that, that makes it feasible to, to create a language that uh, interoperates with Java, uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to deal with, uh, with checked exceptions. Um, so what do I mean by uh, interoperable with Java? It means that from Scala, you can uh, call uh, Java, Java methods, you can instantiate Java classes, um, and also the other way around. Some of the stuff that we have in Scala, uh, you don't have it in, in uh, Java, so if you want to create a library in Scala that you want to be able to use from Java, then you, make sure, you must make sure that the interface of your library is something that uh, you can actually conveniently uh, use from Java, but that's it also means that we can use uh, uh, Java's existing infrastructure like, like Maven or Ivy dependency repositories. Um, and that's also what uh, Scala generally uses. So, on the JVM, everything is a class. Um, but in Scala, not everything is a class. There's some, uh, some Scala code. I'll, I'll quickly go through it um, to, uh, to show you some things. See if I can get this name to work. Yeah. So we define an object here. Um, and an object is like, uh, it's, it's a singleton object in Scala. We can define this, and only one of these will be automatically instantiated at the first axis of this object. Um, basically, what you have in, in Java, where you have a class, and the class has static fields and static methods and regular fields and methods. And they say, well, that's kind of a bit weird. So in uh, in, in Scala you can have that, and for 
for the stuff that, that you would put in static fields and static methods in Java. They're in an object in Sky. Um, in Sky, you can define values, give them a name with the, with the val keyword, and uh, that's an uh, immutable reference. You can also use var to create an immutable reference, um, but well, obviously we don't really need any functional programming, so don't do that. Then we create a main method. Um, this is just very similar to people doing Java as well. You need to tell JVM, hey, it's an actual program that you can run. And if we would run this program, then JVM calls the main method and passes in the, uh, the parameter. Um, well, then we invoke the, the map function on, uh, on our hello string. Uh, string is the character provides so we can map it, give, it, give it this function to uh, uppercase all the characters. Um, and then we print it. This, in Java, this method has the, uh, doesn't have a return type, but it's a void method. It's Scala um, that's made it a, a bit more consistent with uh, just returning stuff. So in Scala, it's said that this function returns unit. Uh, unit is a type and it has one inhabitant also called unit. Uh, so this thing returns unit. Why does this return unit? Because Kringlin, uh returns unit. It only has side effect printing something that doesn't return something useful. So it returns unit. And in Scala, the last uh, expression of a block uh, determines the return type. Mostly everything is an expression in Scala. Uh, everything is a class. This creates two classes actually. It creates the my object uh, class on the JVM that has some static forwarders. Um, and it creates the my object dollar class that's actually instantiated. So there's some code in the static initializer of the my object class that creates a proper instance of this thing, uh, of this my object, and does it once to synchronize stuff. So uh, that's what's uh, simpleton. Um, and then here in the middle, um, there's this lambda function, and it also creates a class. On the JVM, there are no first class uh, uh, functions, so they have to be wrapped in an object. Uh, yeah, for this object, we need a class, so this also creates a class. I have to admit, I'm not sure um, how this will work in uh, Java 8, but Scala can pass to JVM 7 bytecode, so Java doesn't exist. So function values, how are they, how are they uh, represented on the JVM? Um, this, is, this is how we get a, a function, doubler, takes an integer, um, and it, 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 it multiplies the argument by two, and then uh, yeah, returns it. This is syntactic sugar for uh, this. We created an, uh, an instance of this uh, trait function one. A trait in Scala is like an interface in Java, except that uh, traits can have uh, yeah, implement methods as well. So we create an instance of this function one uh, trait. Function one is, is, is the, the interface for functions that have a single parameter, a two type parameters. Uh, one is the type of the parameter, and one is the return type. Um, and has an apply method in which you have the parameter and that returns the uh, result. And this is actually syntactic sugar for this. Uh, yeah, so uh, even more stuff for, uh, for the same, but we never see this. One of the interesting stuff that we see here is that uh, Scala generated a, a new name and it uses some, some dollar signs in there, so it can be sure that it doesn't clash with anything from Java because in Java these are. Uh, embedded names. Function application. Um, well, we've, we've, we've now seen that this, uh, this function that we have here, this function value, is actually just an object that has an apply method. So if we want to, uh, to apply this function, we just call the apply method and then pass it to parameter. There's some syntactic variations that you have uh, that are all vetted. The second one is only the second and third one are only valid for unary functions, functions that take a single parameter. Um, <coughs> so the funky thing is that on an object that has a method called apply, uh, you can leave the method name out. So this is also valid. 
and then basically the circle is round from a function value to how it's represented as a class with the apply method to how you call it. Uh, yeah, you can basically drop the apply method from this side again and it just looks like A function, uh, one of the nice side effects of this syntax is that stuff like array access or uh, accessing the element of a map is also, uh, is also general. This is, there's no special syntax for array access. Uh, it's like this, and there's these shooters to uh, my array followed by seven. Um, yeah, which is nice because that means that we can also use it for data searches that we define ourselves. Um, Scala has a strict evaluation uh, by default. So if we were to, uh, if we were try to make this control structure uh, my if, uh, passing a condition and something that you want to return if it's true or something that you want is false, then that's not great because both are going to be evaluated so if they're side effects and their missiles are gone. Um, but you can uh, use a by name parameter and it looks like this. The only change is that we added the arrow in front of the EAs. Uh, that will wrap this in a thing, and it, it only gets evaluated when we uh, actually need it. And then, uh, yeah, we can use this to create our control structures. Everything is an expression in, in Scala, as well, what I said before. So this uh, might have uh, as, as type A as well. And you can see that. Uh, Unlike in Java, uh, in Scala we can have multiple parameter lists. Um, and well, I guess uh, you can probably imagine how that, what that distributes to. That's really messy with classes with apply methods that uh, return new classes that have apply method that return uh, the eventual thing. And unlike uh, how GHC does that, the VM is not necessarily able to optimize that. Um, so in general, we just use uh, yeah, regular Java style methods where methods have multiple parameters. Um, so unlike Haskell, uh, Scala methods can have multiple parameters. Uh, Scala functions can have multiple parameters. Um, and there's this physical distinction between a function with multiple parameters and a function with multiple parameter lists. But of course, there's functions too. Go back and forth between the two as well. Uh, you've seen the apply syntax where you can also use curlies, and that means that uh, we can use these control structures in a pretty natural way. Uh, for example, um, put in a, 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 a multiple expressions in there, and that the last expression is automatically what's going to be returned. So you can yeah, actually type pretty mm -hmm. nice uh, things with this. Then, um, ADTs, you do them like this. You define a sealed trace, which is basically the, the, the data type, and then uh, multiple instances of these. You can see that we like to wear our keyboards down a bit faster than uh, Haskell programmers. Um, and, of course, the, uh, they, they can have parameters too. So, we have a, a class position. And you can see the case keyword in front of this. Um, case is a modifier that creates some additional stuff for us. So basically, class position would be like a Java, a Java beam uh, position. And case makes it so that the uh, class parameters in my Java, it's kind of you can have class parameters. Case makes it so that the class parameter automatically become fields, and there's automatically uh, a two string and a hash code that equal methods generated, so we can compare these things. Parameters that are in there, um, and we can pattern match on them. Um, and the compiler can do uh, exhaustiveness checking, so if you do the following where we uh, make a move but we don't do anything for the uh, down case, um, and the compiler is going to say, hey, Don't do that. This is the, uh, the option type, that's basically Haskell's maybe type. Uh, um, I wanted to do maybe, but then <coughs> I have to do nothing, and nothing is already a special type in Scala. That's the uh, bottom type that has no inheritance, so I chose for the standard Scala thing called option. Um, yeah, 
two inhabitants. We have some that contains a value or have none that contains nothing. And let's try to do something with this. <coughs> we can say we have a value x, which is of type uh, option administrator. Um, and the, the triple arrows basically throws a runtime exception so it returns nothing. Uh, the bottom type so this compiles and it's going to crash at runtime. That's nice to, uh, yeah, to build your program. Um, and then if we try the following, we say we, we have this value y and it's a type option user and well, what, I'm, what I'm hinting at is that uh, administrator is a subtype of user. We have some type hierarchy where the user is a subtype of administrator. And we say uh, y is x. Um, then it breaks because option is invariant. Um, so we can do it like this. Uh, unlike Java, where uh, arrays are covariant and all the mess that comes with that, uh, by default uh, stuff is invariant. Um, but yeah, we have subtyping, and, and usually once that we, we, want, we, we want to be able to do this, um, so we can make option covariant in the A type parameter by adding a plus, and compile it to check if it's sound. We do it that way, so we use it in a in a uh, variant position. And um, but this works, and now you can see that we can also uh, we've changed um, the non class to an object, so the singleton object, and we made non extended option nothing. Uh, nothing is a subtype of everything, so this is fine, and we can use the single instance of none everywhere um, yeah, where we need one. Implicit parameters in Scala. Um, Okay. Suppose that we uh, want to run a query, we have a query and we need a connection, and we have this method run query that takes a query and a connection and then it's going to produce some uh, DB result. With implicit parameters, you can take some of the pain out of this uh, by marking the connection value that we have with the implicit parameter, and then marking the connection par uh, parameter in the run query also with implicit, and then we don't have to add that. Um, we can just call run query and either is going to think, okay, but it also needs a connection. Do I have an implicit connection in scope? If so, then I'll substitute that. And um, yeah, that makes it a bit easier. And that's the way the type classes are also implemented in Scala. I suppose that we, we take a look at the monoid type class. Uh, should be familiar. And we create an instance uh, string monoid that implements this monoid. Uh, uh, trade type class uh, well, with the empty string and uh, string concatenation, and we mark it as implicit, <coughs> and then we can create a function and concat that takes a list of a and needs a uh, yeah, needs proof that, that uh, we have a monoid for a, and then we fold it. Uh, we can do it in this way, and um, that means that this pattern of type classes in Scala is implemented without any special language support for type classes. It's just uh, doable this way uh, with the combination of, uh, of traits and implicit parameters. Uh, there's some syntactic sugar. It's called a context bound for the first line, and syntactic sugar for the second line, where we can say uh, we do mconcat and a um, context bound by monoid, meaning there must be a monoid instance for a. Uh, in order to uh, to make this work, so it also gets effectively a bit better than um, that the second line with all the implicit parameters uh, messing up your uh, your API. Um, well, here's here's some more uh, type classes we have we have shows uh, and an object to to find these type classes, uh, and we can we can derive them or we can. Create the right type class so we can create a, a, a shows for a list. Uh, given context bound that A has shows, we can create the instance uh, for a list of A's. Okay, so that's some of the Scala stuff. Now, the, the bad side uh, functional programming in Scala is, is pretty terrible. Um, Scala doesn't have tail call elimination, only self cursed tail calls uh, can be eliminated. Um, so we need trampolines. Although I think I have to talk to Atze if there's better stuff than, than that. Uh, which means there's memory overhead, programmer overhead, that's the worst of course. There's performance overhead and uh, also that the JVM can necessarily figure out that the stuff that you're... 
the stuff that you're doing is, uh, is the hot loop. Um, yeah, so performance overhead can be, uh, can be pretty bad. Um, there's more roadblocks that, that kinds are not inferred. Uh, the monoid type stuff that I've shown, I've specified that the parameter is, is a proper type. So you cannot just implement it for list because then the compiler is going to say, oh, list doesn't have to write kind. Uh, it's not a proper type, uh, type constructor. Um, they're, they're not polymorphic, so if, if we want to implement monoid for list, which well, seems reasonable, right? Um, then we need to do some tricks with the devs, and uh, it gets annoying. Gets annoying and uh, kinds of never occur. Uh, type inference doesn't work for recursive functions, which is annoying. And uh, as you've seen, the functions are boxed, so there's a runtime representation of function, uh, which is also not what you want. You want to minimize this uh, runtime representation. Um, so, then an interactive uh, slide. Will I not read the paper fast enough to make it's morally correct? Who's not read it? Who's not, who has not read it? Yeah. I also haven't read it. Um, <laughs> so I feel, I feel better now that you also haven't read it. And if the authors make the case that basically the intuitive reasoning that we do, um, that's actually only justified, um, in, or, or that's, yeah, that we do because we, we act like um, our programs are written in a total language that is justified to also use this reasoning. In our, in our partial languages. Uh, and that's basically the reasoning that we could do here. Suppose that we have a function foo that takes a, a type A as a parameter, but we don't know anything about the A, and it turns a boolean, then how many implementations would this have? Two implementations. Well, that's true. Um, <laughs> three. Three? Three also modern. Right, there's, well, there's actually a bit more implementations. Here's a whole bunch of implementations. So we can do some side effect there. Um, we could uh, do, do type testing or type casing, check if it's, uh, if it's in type. Uh, we can throw an exception, we can return null. Um, yeah, we can, um, we can use the to string that any object in, on the JVM has uh, to check if maybe the, the string representation is banana. Uh, and we can look at the class, and we can even do stuff with threads that's all, all messed up. Mm -hmm. So, some people have defined these Scalazi safe Scala subsets. Scala Z is the most popular uh, functional programming library in Scala Z. And they basically say, don't do all these things, don't use null, don't use exceptions, don't use type case and casting, don't use side effects, don't use the methods on any, don't use notify or wait, and don't look at the class of stuff. Uh, and then you're good. So, good on the good on the time. Let's thank you. Yeah. Thank you. If you don't need the JVM for anything, is there anything other than that in Scala uh, that might be a new for testing? Uh, um, what are the nice features? Um, well, one of the, the, <laughs> one of the nice. Features uh, is, for example, this one um, that type classes are our first class, uh, first class values. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we could have multiple monoids for integers, one sum monoid and one uh, product monoid, and we can choose what we want to do. Wow. And that's sometimes slightly less awkward than doing all, all the new types in, in Haskell. I think that's more or less the only thing. Uh, if you're not bound to the JVM, then you're asked. Well, I'm actually good that uh, subtyping might be useful. Um, I, I, I don't do much Haskell, so I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that uh, most people that try to take uh, functional programming to do pretty far in Scala, uh, they stop using uh, subtyping, uh, the Scala Z library, the most popular library in, in the most recent version. Um, they basically stopped supporting subtyping, so they took variance annotations out of everything and said, well, uh, everything is invariant because it, stuff gets too complex. So, yeah. That's, that's, that might be an interesting lesson uh, to be learned from Scott. One more very brief question. So, I might immediately say that this is probably the, the, the nicest feature of Scala because my Twitter stream is like a constant stream of complaints about people saying that implicit make it completely impossible to reason about their codes and they wish Scala never had it. Yep. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true.
Although yeah, I guess sure yeah, there's a definite Twitter is not a logical fallacy, to be honest. <laughs> well, well, to be honest, there's people that, that think that this is a really bad idea, that you can have no place in subscribe classes, so that debate's not over yet. Um, but implicit in Scala, um, there are a whole bunch of different implicits. There's, there's these kind of implicits, but there's also implicit convergence, for example, the one that you see on slide one, where we do map on a string. But a Scala string is basically a Java string, which certainly does not have a map method. But then there's an implicit conversion that you can do. Uh, if the Scala compiler sees that type doesn't have a map method, then maybe there's a function defined as implicit that takes a string as a parameter and returns something that has a map method. Um, then we'll apply that function and invoke the map method on that result. So that's pretty scary. <laughs> if you combine that with wildcard imports, then you don't know where that's coming from. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's messed up. Okay, let's uh, for the questions. Let's thank take you. them offline, and let's uh, thank our.